Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast. Before I dig in, I want to thank everybody who's gone on to LinkedIn, connected up with me. Follow the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast company page. Just search for it. You'll see the icon come up. If you could follow that, that really helped me. And if you see my content flying by, either with the podcast uh, company page or my happy little face, I'd really appreciate a like, comment, and or a share. Uh, before we get into the interview, I want to ask you a question. Are, are you full every week of meetings, great qualified conversations with new opportunities? Is your day, your week, your month just booked up with new opportunities and a full pipeline? Or are you spending your time oh, getting rejected, no response, no one picking up, people asking you to take you off the list? It's just rough out there. I know it. But I came up with a system. It started about five years ago when I came out, went out on my own. And I've developed it and polished it over the last five years. I taught it for the last three in person. Now it's online in a course called Start the Conversation, Get the Meeting. You can find it at b2brevenue.com under training. And if the podcast makes sense to you, you, is this the type of environment that you're selling into? I think you're really going to enjoy the course. You get access to it for a full year. And it's not just videos. It has videos, tons of examples, and now almost 25 hours of world, (laughs) real world case studies, what we call office hours, where Every week and a half, we have a group call. You can also schedule one-on-ones. You can send me examples, and I respond back to you. Uh, You can ask questions at any time. We can have one-on-ones to go through your process and what you're running up to and get some coaching, some hints that will make it better. So go to b2brevenue.com, and if you want to talk to me about it, you can schedule the time. I got my calendar link there. You can check the courses out. The other one, are you running into deals getting stuck? When you get into the complex sale, it's very different than the transactional sale. There's a course called Closing the Complex Sale. Also want to check that out if your deals are getting stuck, if you're running into tons of competition, uh, people are beating you down about pricing versus value, and if your deals are just taking way too long. Let's get into the interview. Hey, Frank, as a way of getting started, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and what the motivation was to write your book. Well, I've been in journalism um, most of my life. Uh, I'm, I'm, I still am in many ways. <laughs> and uh, what you do there is you ask questions, and they become an amazing key to open all kinds of doors, some locked and some not. And uh, just the delight I, I've had over the course of my life in discovering ideas and people and things uh, was something that I realized um, was empowering. And then I, over the years, especially as I started teaching and hanging out with my own kids, I realized we, we don't ever study how to ask a good question. We don't ever study what the composition is. We don't actually think deeply about the excellent listening, the active listening that should attend um, a questioning so that you can question more deeply what you're listening for, words, expressions, phrases. And as I started tackling the book, I realized the way I wanted to come at this was through these categories of questions, because each is driven by a different outcome in my book. And knowing and understanding the outcome and the different listening skills attached to each and how we can pursue each, we can be better at each. And so that's where it all came from. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Everyone teaches how to present and how to debate, but nobody really teaches how to ask questions and how to listen. Right. And in in, in journalism, for example, and, and I've done a lot of interviewing, show interviewing and that kind of thing, so much of it is in the follow-up. What do you hear that makes you ask that next, next question? What are you trying to accomplish in the string of five questions? Uh, it's not unlike, a, and well, it's, it is different, but there's a, the, the, a corollary would, would sort of be, you know, the lawyer in the courtroom has a very yeah. specific uh, objective that he or she is trying to get out of the witness. And there's going to be this series of questions that you know, leads to the big aha moment, right? Well, that's not by accident. No, it's not. (laughs) Very very choreographed. So what if we were all more thoughtful in the way we approach these sorts of things? That's it. And probably in sales, there was a big push in the early 90s with questions. There was a book written by um, uh, Neil Rackham called Spin Selling Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of oversimplified the, the, the four kinds of questions he had. 
and the sequence to use them. Now, yours are similar in some ways, but much more detailed and I think more powerful. And I, I like how the book was written where you, you, you describe the type of question and then back it up with several stories. Well, to me, it's all, I'm, I'm a storyteller and I am a big believer in stories because that's how we learn and remember. That's one thing. And the other thing is I wanted the people that I got for the stories to be interesting in their own right, to be successful in the way they ask those questions and to be inspiring to people. And some of them are famous and are dealing with gigantic issues like Colin Powell deciding whether we go to war or not. And some of them are wonderful, ordinary human beings uh, like my <laughs> name, the roofer <laughs> or the nurse practitioner or people at a, at a, at a business who are trying to, to spark their employees to share a mission through the questions that they pose to them so that they can come to realize, you know, to these conclusions and to the realization themselves, rather than being told at the end of a lecture, here's what you're doing. It's much more powerful, and the research shows this. People remember what they say much more than what they hear. That's true, and that, that really resonated um, out of yeah. the book for me. Right, and so if, if you can, if you throw a question, you spark somebody to say something, uh, that sticks. Yeah, and I've had um, hypnotists and uh, neuro-linguistic programmers on the course, and they they say questions are the only real mind control that we have. That's why I stay away from them. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure you, you've seen you know great reporters or great interviewers and uh, mediocre or even poor interviewers. How do the great ones build up their questions? Well, there are so many different styles, and this is what's kind of fun about this and what people should remember, and I say this throughout the book. There is no one formula for this. Uh, so much of it is driven by you and your personality, by you and your level of inquisitiveness, by you and those things that, that, that you are. So, for example, one of the people in the book, she happens to be a, 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 a consultant to philanthropists and, and, and fundraisers, and she's all about what you do when you're trying to get somebody to write a check is you don't walk in the room and say, can you please write me a check? You walk in the room and you, you generate a conversation through a series of questions to discover the sort of shared mission in life, right? So um, I think that the most important thing uh, to keep in mind with great interviewers is A, they're fabulous listeners, B, they are well prepared, C, they follow up, they ask series of questions to draw someone out. Um, and, and, and finally, they really know what they're after. They, they, are you trying to make a sale? Are you trying to change a mind? Are you trying to discover new information? Are you trying to fix a leak? Each one of those objectives drives a different form of questioning and uh, uh, sort of the frame to the whole discussion. And let's say like diagnosis questions, those are critical in sales to make sure that you understand someone's problem or the, the opportunity that they're trying to solve, what they're really trying to seek. Uh, how, do, how have you applied those to, to really have a great interview? Every day because I have lots of problems. <laughs> so, you know, in the, in the book, I have three characters in this chapter. One character is a nurse practitioner in Appalachia. She works with some of the poorest people in America. Uh, many of whom um, do not even have the resources to go to a doctor uh, or who are, you know, concealing something because they're embarrassed or, or, or they, they just are trying to ignore the, the problem because it's just too big. Uh, another character in, the, in, in, the, in that chapter is uh, a guy who's a Wall Street turnaround artist. He's a, had an amazing career, uh, hangs out very nicely on Park Avenue in New York, <laughs> has done very, very, very well from, for himself, grew up at the... Uh, working uh, in his early days with Lee Iacocca at Chrysler when Chrysler had to, you know, try to rescue itself with a lot of federal help. And then the third character is my neighbor, the roofer. So what each of these people is doing in their own way is they are plunged into a situation. There is a problem. There is something wrong. We do not yet know what the problem is. The clock is ticking. If we don't fix it, something much worse is going to happen. So they all go for the same thing. Describe the symptom. Connect it to past activities or actions. What, you know, your elbow hurts. Does it only hurt when you straighten your arm or you flex your arm? Your roof is leaking. Does it, does it leak when the wind is blowing or just when it's raining? And they, they history take. That's what doctors call history taking. So you try to connect things to the past so you can draw patterns and lessons that you can apply to the future. And then they use their experience and their listening to say, okay, um, more than likely, this is what the problem is. You know, oftentimes there's no guarantee. But getting to that combination of, 
of describing questions, describing the symptoms, describing what's wrong, asking a series of questions about that, connecting that to patterns when those symptoms have been detected, and connecting it to um, what have you tried or done in the past to, to really draw it out and marry experience to symptom is, is sort of the secret of that kind of questioning. And that, that's insanely powerful because you've got to know what problem you're really trying to solve and to understand it and to address it in a certain way. But once you've diagnosed it, what type of questions would you then use to build more rapport and trust? Well, uh, what do you want to do about that? I mean, if you're talking about building rapport and trust, uh, there, uh, there's a chapter in the book I call bridge building questions. And these are questions that are often um, conducted in the character I have in this particular chapter um, is a guy who works with the FBI and Secret Service and the U.S. Marshals in what's called dangerous threat assessments. So these are people who write horribly threatening letters to the president of the United States or something else. And then everybody, you know, the question for them is, is someone who seems to be threatening to do something terrible actually capable of doing something terrible? And there's all, and they, they'll bring these people in and they question them. Well, okay, this is an extreme example, right? But I, I used it because it is, and it's just this wonderfully interesting, intriguing example. But these people are isolated. They often think that no one listens to them. Many of them have mental illness or other problems. And if they're too, you know, if it's too extreme, nothing will work. But most of them tend to be, according to, to Barry Spodak, my character, they're reachable. They are, they are human puzzles, he says. They are angry. They are alienated. They are distant. They feel isolated. And they feel that nobody listens to them. The rapport building is to make them feel listened to. So the questions are designed to draw that person out. I almost called this chapter of terrorists and teenagers because it fits the bill exactly. <laughs> a lot of commonality <laughs> there. <laughs> but the, what I hope that people will draw from this is not that everybody's a potential murderer out there, not by any stretch of the imagination. But Barry uses, for example, what he calls micro affirmations through his conversations. He'll acknowledge something, some, uh-huh, oh, that's interesting. He'll nod, he'll, he'll cock an eyebrow, whatever. And he'll draw people out. But that's interesting. Tell me more about that. And his whole effort is to draw people out and en encourage them to talk. So that works with your kid. That works with a client. That works in a teacher-student relationship. Draw them out piece by piece. Barry refers to people as puzzles. They're human puzzles. And he tries to put those puzzles together piece by piece. By the way, he was John Hinckley's, as a very young man, he was John Hinckley's group therapist, the man who tried to shoot and kill Ronald Reagan. So Barry knows what he's talking about. Yeah, I remember when that happened. <laughs> that was scary. Now, once you have that empathy, you talk a lot about creativity questions and strat strategic questions about building a compelling future uh, for the person to get them to imagine a different future. Um, how did you come up with those types of questions? Um, through a number of things, I, I, I uh, at my alma mater, Middlebury College, uh, some years ago I was on the board of trustees and we had a facilitator come in and say, okay, imagine this college is the number one school uh, in small liberal arts colleges. It's five years from now, you've just gotten the reports back, you're number one, what are you doing? He took a future scenario and put it in a present tense question. A few years later, I started doing uh, here in Washington what's called tabletop exercises. It's what the military and Homeland Security does, and they sort of war game actual scenarios, and you pretend that the future is upon you. And I realized that in both cases, and in other cases I've been involved with, what, what people are being asked to do is they're being asked to create an imagined reality, and they're in it, and they're speaking in the present tense. And what that does is it does several things. It leapfrogs all the 5,000 reasons that you don't think you can actually get there because you, you time travel to that point. And, it, and if you ask the right questions and you invite people to tell you what that future looks like, open your eyes, look around you, what are you doing? How's the business look? Who are your customers? How many are they? Where are they coming from? What does your ad campaign look like? You, you give them permission to dream. Yeah, it's almost like a, a trial close where you're, you're assuming things are going to go positively and right. you're trying to get them to commit to some action there. Right. And McKinsey has done some very interesting research themselves on brainstorming sessions, corporate brainstorming sessions, what constitutes a great brainstorming session. And it's all about getting people to leave their space and to leave the familiar. 
often through the question that you pose. I, the way I view it is the question is the time machine. Yes. And, and, and that's what you, you want to use it as a time machine to transport some, somebody to another place so they can engage that imagined reality and start to really think, not outside the box, but burn the box, you know? And, right, and, yeah. And, and Just... really go for it. Now, I'm sure you've interviewed difficult people and people who didn't want to answer your questions directly. <laughs> mm, more than once. <laughs> how, do you, how do you get people to focus and how do you get them not to just tell you their, their pitch? You, know, uh, you ask again and again and again. You ask in different ways. You come at the problem in a number of different ways. You don't start with the hard question. You start with icebreakers. You start with open-ended questions. <clears throat> it's the same, very much the same sort of thing. And again, I write about this quite a bit through the book. These are sort of open-ended questions that a doctor or a therapist will do to get you talking. How are you doing today? You don't know where that will go. Right. Uh, Barry, when he's doing his dangerous threat assessment, when he talks to agents, he will act, and he talks about Dan Kahneman's research and sort of system one and system two in the brain when the red flags are up versus when they're not. Often he'll tell an agent, don't start with the interrogation. You walk into someone's home and compliment them on the artwork or the picture of their family on the, on the desk. Go to a place where people are comfortable to get them to, to get them talking, to build a rapport, even if it's a shallow or, 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 or small one to start with. So that's what you do. And then as, as you go forward, I have a chapter on confrontational questions. Now this typically happens when I'm interviewing people or when you're interviewing people kind of in the public domain, or if you're a lawyer or whatever, and, and you've got a, a subject who has no intention of answering your question or is going to try to dodge it or duck it. Uh, I've had several of those. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. And you just have to be very, very persistent. Uh, sometimes you'll get something. Often you will. Uh, often you'll put somebody kind of on the spot and you have this kind of for the record moment. Um, other times they just shut down. And that says something, too. You can't force someone to open up if they're absolutely determined not to. Right, and I see it too often on TV where they start with the hard question. And obviously it's a question that the the politician's been prepared for and they just try and turn it into whatever they want. Uh, when, 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 I, when I worked years ago at, at CNN, um, when Larry King was on the air, you remember Larry King, right? Oh, yeah. Larry, Larry King used to drive all the reporters at CNN crazy. Because Larry King would get the president. Larry King would get, you know, the candidate is about to announce he or she is running for office. Larry King would get these people at the pinnacle of the news cycle. And all the reporters were there saying, wait a minute, we're the journalists here. We're the ones who should grill that person. And Larry King would start, and this is what made people crazy, he'd start by saying, so, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you write the book? So, if you get elected, what are you going to do? And, 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 the, and, and we thought these are ridiculous softball questions. What they are is they're what we call indirect or open-ended questions. And the advantage to those is they give that other person the freedom to go wherever they want. They don't start by painting them into a corner. Whereas the Sunday talk shows and what we do in journalism too much starts by putting people right on the defensive. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> if you want someone to, if you, if, you, if you want to, if you're doing something for purpose, put them right on the defensive and let it play out. But if you really want people to open up, that is not a good way to start. So he kind of let them do their thing and then kind of went around it. So that... And I would, I would tell you this, and I actually did an interview with Larry for this book. Uh, he's still, at 83, he is still asking questions and still doing this. Um, he, he tended to produce remarkably uh, candid comments from people because he wasn't threatening them. And, and that is an important lesson to keep in mind. It doesn't always work. I mean, sometimes you really have to bear in and, and, and lean on somebody. But you want to be very deliberate about that. And that's the point that I make. Be very thoughtful before you go at someone like that, because that is the blunt force instrument of questioning. And what, what was your hardest interview? Oh, I've had lots of them. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was a tough one, because unlike most people, um, especially when you sit them in front of a camera, she had absolutely no qualms, no hesitation whatsoever about saying, well, that's a perfectly stupid question. <laughs> Makes you feel good, huh? I am utterly challenging the premise and the person. Most people don't do that. We have a president now who does. So in his own way, with a very different accent, he, he, he does it. Most people don't do that. So when someone does that, you have to be uh, steely because you, A, have to stand up to the challenge, and B, you darn well better know what you're talking about and have as many facts in, in your brain as you can, and not just facts, but kind of 
good responses to be able to respond. The other one, and I write about this in the book, very, very, very difficult interview and ultimately horribly frustrating, was when I interviewed Yasser Arafat here in Washington in front of a, the Council on Foreign Relations, 250 people in the room and cameras from all over the world. And we were in the middle of one of the uprisings in the Middle East and children, Palestinian kids were going out and throwing rocks and getting shot and it was terrible stuff. And there was a call from all over the world for Arafat to tell his people to keep their children inside and keep the children out of the fight. And he refused to do it. And I knew I needed to ask him about that. And it just exploded. I spent all day kind of studying the question, talking to people who knew him, thinking about how I could craft it. I write about that in the book, how I how I put that question together and why. And he just exploded. And uh, I thought he was going to walk out. He didn't. But it was a very unsettling and unsatisfying interview. Now, when, when you're interviewing somebody of that stature, either a president or a prime minister, what type of preparation do you go through? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, you, you, you know, and, and, and this, too, I think, uh, applies in, in other walks of life. You know, if you're going in for a job interview, think of it as you're going in to interview the president or be interviewed by the president. Uh, you, you want to really study what that person has done, what they have said, what they are in the middle of right now, where there, where there is controversy or debate or conflict around them or tension. So you know either what to engage or what to avoid. Uh, you want to be very thoughtful about exactly what you're listening for. Are you listening for uh, news, detail, data, stories, people? Is there a particular objective that you've got? So you, you prepare in that way. And, and then ultimately, I'll write out all kinds of notes and I'll, I'll do an outline and I'll anticipate their responses and I will create what I call clusters of questions. So let's say I'm going to ask about um, uh, the budget. That I'm going to interview the budget boss, and I want to talk about where the company is going to be spending money next quarter. But specifically, I want to talk about where we're investing. And specifically in the investing, I want to talk about um, where we're investing uh, in California, because that's been our growth market. So I will I might start broad on investing, come down to California, come down to what we're trying to accomplish, come down to what the competition is, but really create a, th a thematic flow for the questioning. And that's certainly what I do in, in those kinds of preparations when I'm going in for someone like that. And then you have to throw it all out, walk around the block, because once you get in and have the conversation, it may go in a completely un undetermined direction. So you need to be kind of knowledgeable about what you're going to do and not tied to a, a note or a script because life doesn't work in notes and scripts. Right, yeah. You all, need, all need to be able to look down and refer to them, Yeah. But you need to be able to listen and go in different directions. Now, your book is a very different type of book, meaning that it's not like a business book directly, it's, it, nor is it, uh, you know, kind of a, a, what I call bubblegum books, like Malcolm Gladwell stuff, where, where it's pure entertainment. Uh, it's kind of instruction, yet storytelling, very easy to read. How, how should people leverage it? I, I hope people will leverage this in their lives. I hope questions are like air. We don't even think about them. Think about when you've gotten together with a great friend and at the end, and, and then you, and you part and you realize your friend said to you, hey, how's it going? And that's kind of where it stopped. But since you last saw your friend, 27 incredible things in your life have happened, good, bad, and otherwise. Think you're with a partner, a wife, a spouse, whatever. And, and, and what happens when you pose something as a question rather than just as a statement? And you make a deliberate attempt to draw that person out. I hope that people will take from this book that whether they are trying to solve a problem, connect with another human being, understand that human being better, set really creative, crazy goals for themselves, look over the horizon, or assess the meaning of their lives, each of these things we can do better, they can do better, and more successfully, by coming up with five great questions going into a, a conversation or a meeting or a party. I have a chapter on entertaining questions. You can be the best party host if you throw some crazy, fun, funny question on the table and you get everybody engaging rather than people going off in their own little pockets and just talking to themselves. So I got one really hard question for you. Okay. How, how do you get all these interviews for, for your book? I beg, I beg, you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure you, your network is vast and deep, but I'm sure a lot of them are also reasonably cold. Um, 
Jorge Ramos uh, from the Univision, Univision Act anchor. I, I just called him out of the blue. Uh, Colin Powell, I've covered for many years. I went back to him because he's one of the most inquisitive people I know. Ed Bernero, the, the, the showrunner and producer in Hollywood, I got to him through a super lawyer friend of mine. I called him and said, who's the most inquisitive person and successful person you know? And asked him. My neighbor, the roofer, I went over to him and I said, Al, can I talk to you? How, you do, how do you fix roofs? <laughs> and, 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 and he's just started telling me. Um, so it's interesting because when, look, Here's, the, here's, a, here's a point I'll leave you with if, if we're getting to the end here. We say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. That's true, but so in the right way and the right tone is questioning because when you ask someone a question, you say, I care about you. I care about what you think. I'm interested in listening to you. And basically that's what I did when I asked people to, to sit with me for the book. I'm interested in you. I want to know how you do what you do and do it with a question. Can we talk? That's Most great. Of, all yeah. of them said yes. And if people want to learn more about you in the book, uh, where, where should they go? Well, if they want to learn more about me, they're out of luck because there's nothing more to learn. But anyway, <laughs> it's all there. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I'd love for them to go to askmorebook.com and you'll see uh, all about the book. You'll see some of these other uh, conversations and things I've written about it. They can People can read a sample chapter, buy the book. So askmorebook.com is, is the place to go and all the, all the right buttons are there. Great. Thanks for being on today, Frank. It is my great pleasure and good luck. And by the way, I love your questions. You've, you, I, you've, you've, you've generated a terrific conversation. I'd look forward to doing it with you again anytime you'd like. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode. And I really would appreciate everybody who goes on to LinkedIn, connects up with me or follows me there. If you happen to see some of my content flying by, if you could throw a little thumbs up or a comment or a share, I definitely appreciate it. It helps spread the word about the podcast and make sure you're checking out my website, b2brevenue.com. You can get my free book on how companies make product selections. It's a real book. Uh, it, was on, it is on Amazon, but I give it away for free. Just register there. It'll email you a link to it, and you can just download the PDF from there. Also, if you want to check out the courses, start the conversation, get the meeting, or closing the complex sale, and you have more questions about it, the short answer is there are video courses. You get access for a year, but it's also a community. What does that mean? You can ask questions anytime via voicemail or email. I answer them within a week, put them into the course. We have office hours every other week. It's an hour long. We course where you can basically i pick a topic answer questions you can ask questions also you can schedule one-on-ones for free and we just talk through your particular use case and that gets shared with the course so if you don't have time for office hours or the timing doesn't work or you just want some more one-on-one help that's all included for a whole year so it's really a a year to go from where you are to where you want to be and so it's not just videos it's not just knowledge it's practice it's getting feedback you can send me emails you can send me uh your presentation i'll help you with anything that you need to close the complex sale or get the meeting and you can check out them at b2brevenue.com So that's it. I really appreciate it. And please tell somebody about the podcast and let me know if I can help you in any way. Oh, and you want to hear some results from the course? Well, here you go. You you know, I love the approach. It's working for me just fantastic. If I sent you some of the emails, which I should, the conversations that I'm having with people, I, I think you'd be blown away because they're not really about work. Yeah. I've figured out if you can kind of get personal with them, like one lady, it's all about her family, kids. And then I sprinkled in a little bit around work and she's LinkedIn, sending me messages on LinkedIn, <laughs> photos of her family. <laughs> um, no, I'm not even kidding. I should show this to you. You'd be stunned. I was shocked. And we're going, she, she even, we're going to lunch on September 6th. And yesterday <laughs> she shot me a LinkedIn message and said, Hey, Ron, why don't we get on the phone and do a video call beforehand so our lunch isn't so awkward? We're like barely not meeting each other for the first time. <laughs> oh, holy cow, right? Like this is unbelievable. So this is not the first time that this has happened. She's kind of an extreme, yeah. but um, I'm starting to figure out a pattern where I can actually make this a process, you know? So good, good. Yeah. I'll show you that. So 
it's getting to that point. And I'm kind of, every time I do this, I'm like, God, this is unbelievable. You know? So, and it feels better too, doesn't it? Oh, Brian, let me tell you something to be able to go, go to lunch with her. I'll even talk to her on the phone, right? We're going to talk about, uh, family, kids, work-life harmony. Cause we read, a, I shared a thing with her from Bezos about work-life harmony. This is where the conversation will start. Now, at some point we're both not stupid, right? We know we're going to talk about work. <laughs> we know why we're both there. Right. But to kick it off this way is so much better. And to end that lunch with the last five to eight minutes of telling, you know, well, what are you guys doing with digital? 